sometimes you just kind of get pushed into service to serve. Uh, apparently Ava was done with this. She took off the wrapper, took another bite, and handed it to me. Sometimes you're, you're pressed into service. Sometimes you offer to serve, and you get your hands filled with something wonderful and beyond words. Amen. We at Bethel Baptist Church do not see children as an interruption. Amen. As parents, you do. That's understandable because <laughs> I'm a parent. But here at Bethel, hopefully everyone, and I, I believe we have, we've bought into the reality that uh, we're here to help you. We're here to help you. We love you. We love you right where you're at. And we're willing to meet you where you're at and go further with you to the glory of God. So what I did this morning was no rebuke to these young people at all. It was fun. You should have seen the look on their faces. First of all, they had already had to squeeze in just to get all those people on that one short pew, the shortest pew in the church. And then they see this 200 none your business preacher, and, I, and he's going to sit in between them. God parted the sea, <laughs> and I was able to sit. And that was fun. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, every Sunday we ask you to help us to be that transformational church so that we will spend time with you, not just today on a corporate level, but Monday through Saturday we will spend time with you. And when we meet those within our sphere of influence, they will know that we've spent time with you. We pray for our cancer sick, Amy Banderman, Millie Barnes, Sandy Ballou, Sue Brand, Karen Fleer, Dan Goodman, Glenn Prince, Robert Rapold, that you would heal them completely, totally, and wholly of cancer. We pray for the Martins, the Lowers, the Nances, the Henthorns, the Donkeys, the Murphys, the Havrilkes, the Ramses, Benjamin Kingston, Rachel and Hannah Licklider, Bethany Sullivan, Brandon Wise, Lucas Eves, that you would use them, give them that spiritual breath of relief, Give them that spiritual breath that they need to be the lighthouse of the gospel in their community, in their work, in their home, in their church, in their neighborhood. Lord, I pray that you would bless this offering for the furtherance of your kingdom. And I pray that you would meet our financial needs through your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13. Thank you, ma'am. Sometimes you're pressed into service. Before we look at that passage, and we've honestly got several elements of today's service. And this will be our first element, and then we will enter into our message, and then we will have an important element of uh, announcements and preparation for tonight. But you may or may not be aware that today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Just, just so, I, what, well, how would you say it? Full disclosure, I failed to do this in first service, and I apologize. Stacy is so faithful to keep this in front of me uh, every October. That is our chance as a church to get physically involved and go to the life chain and quietly stand with a sign that says pray to end abortion or something along those lines. Uh, and we try to be active. And you know what we did for Christmas to support uh, the my medical uh place there in uh, High Ridge. And so Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, it just simply says this, it's observed each year on the Sunday closest to the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. If we honored each baby aborted since 1973 with a moment of silence, we would be silent for over 100 years. And that's just the United States of America. 
We believe that human beings are created by God in his image. Amen, church? Therefore, every person from conception to natural birth possesses integrity, dignity, and an immeasurable worth, including unborn children, elderly individuals, and those with special needs. Christians, then, are called to defend, protect, and value all human life. These are the facts. 3,400 abortions happen each day in the U.S. That is almost three abortions every minute. Every four minutes, a life is saved at a pregnancy care center. 93% of abortions happen because of an unwanted pregnancy. 35% of all women will have at least one abortion by the time they are 45. Ronald Reagan established Sanctity of Human Life Day, continued with George H. Bush, was discontinued with Bill Clinton and brought back with George W. Bush. 2015 brought new recognition of what happens at some abortion clinics with the selling of body parts, adding wrong on top of a wrong. Every abortion represents two lives, the child and the mother. What can you do? You can pray. You can pray for a woman who find themselves in a circumstance where they feel there is no way out but through abortion. If you're under the sound of my voice and you have, quote, unquote, an unwanted pregnancy, I believe this is a God-ordained divine appointment for you to hear from me with absolutely no judgment. God loves you. He sees you. What lady was it that he told that? Was that Hannah? No, it was uh, Hagar. I knew, I knew Gavin knew this because we've talked about it, and he's talked about it in his uh, Bible times. Hagar was the handmaiden of Abraham, and they were illegitimately trying to get a heir to Abraham. They were basically working against God. And so Abraham impregnated Hagar to have an heir. Well, God had promised Abraham that Sarah would bear his child to be the inheritance. Watch this. But God wasn't against Hagar. And when Hagar was expelled by a very jealous Sarah, God met with her and said, I see you. And so no matter your circumstance or situation, no matter your choices, God sees you, he loves you, and he wants the best for you. So for women, pray for women who find themselves in a circumstance where they feel there's no way out but through abortion, for God to provide them another answer and for life, and then reach out. There may be someone in your church facing this situation or that has been through an abortion and needs God's healing. Reaching out to the mother can result in saving a life. And I will add to this, I've tried to make no bones about it, and this isn't me slapping myself on the back. I'm telling you that uh, God has made it very clear to me. It is not enough for me to say I'm pro-life. It's not enough for me to tell you to be pro-life. We've got to be pro-life. And sometimes that means, well, no, all the time that means action of some level. Whether it is praying for those things that we have stated or watch this, helping that single mother once she's made the choice for life. They need help. Some of them are working two and three jobs. They need help. And so I I'm begging you. If you need help on any level along these lines, even if it's you need help to pray for the people you're trying to reach out to, you come to me. We'll do our best to help you. Let's all stand for the reading and reverence of God's holy word. First Corinthians chapter four, or 13. First Corinthians chapter 13. Brent, so Brent, you're excluded from this opportunity. Brent's already won himself a candy bar because he knew this answer. This is 18 years old and younger. Uh, just the, the first person, what is this chapter called? Bo, you know? He was in the first service. All right. Well, hey, I appreciate the effort, Bo. I do. Somebody know what this chapter's called, 18 and younger, that wasn't in the first service? Anybody? 18 years old and younger? Say again. First chapter. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not. Did I tell you all where to turn to? First Corinthians? You, oh, <laughs> well, I, Thank you, Brother David. Thank you, Brother David. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What's it called? Somebody 18 or younger? Jake. 
it, it is. It's called the love chapter. Jake, you got your candy bar. All right. Now, it's called the love chapter. Why is it called the love chapter? There's nothing riding on this. Anybody know? It speaks about love. Thank you, Molly. It just tells us about love. You and I are not going to serve people if we do not love people. We're not. But the people that we love, we're going to serve them. And watch this. Did you know that you don't have to know them to love them? Because love's a choice. Love's a choice. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own is not provoked, thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Father, we ask you to add your blessings to the reading and preaching of your holy word. Again, Father, change us to look more like you. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. You may be seated. When Dawn and I first got married, we were like any typical newly married couple. There, there were issues and the such, but there was something that I really hadn't thought about or expected, to be honest with you, and it really had nothing to do with her and I fighting or anything along those lines. But when she would go, she would go from the house the cash saver, let's say, and never come home, <laughs> be gone, and gone, and gone, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, okay, it's, it's a 10-minute drive to cash saver, it's a 10-minute drive back, that's 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes tops to get your stuff, that's not even an hour yet, it's been three hours, where is this woman? I mean, is that, is that how it's going to be? I mean, we've been married for six months, and then, boom, see ya. I would understand it <laughs> because I know me. But, I mean, you know, not, not a, it's been nice, it's been real, nothing. Just gone. And then I start worrying because I know, Ben, that, that's not what happened here. She hadn't left you. She's been in an accident. That's what it is. Oh. She's dead. Or she's dying. She's bleeding out right now. I don't know where she's at. Because, folks, this was before the days of cell phones. Yeah, yeah, she couldn't text. She wouldn't anyway. She couldn't call. She wouldn't anyway. I've learned that. But the point is, is I got no way of knowing, and it's been three hours, and I am struggling. And the Holy Spirit was faithful. I assume, I hope, I pray he does the same with you. Love bears all things. Ben, if the worst case scenario has happened, I'm going to carry you through it. If she is in a perilous situation, I'm going to carry her through it. Love hopes all things. Ben, she's just slow. She's just slow. She found somebody, and bless her heart, she's talking. You know, well, whatever. And, and I can't remember all of this, how it would play out. I'm sure Don could tell you. But when she'd get home, it, she had to take about a 10, 15-minute chew. Where have you been? You know. But that was unneeded also because God had done exactly what he said he would do. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Church. Why could the Apostle Paul say that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Because he knew one of his brothers, per inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in John was going to say, God is love. God is love. So in this passage, you can replace the word love with God. 
God loves all people. God bears all things. You can have hope because of God. God is love. Now, when you and I connect with that, it's not going to be long. He's going to say, so now I need you to take my love to the people. I need you to take my love to everyone that needs it. Now, just so you understand what's going on uh, with this uh, confounded uh, earpiece here, uh, I, I ha did not have it attached to my shirt so that when I took off my coat earlier and it just straightened it straight out. <laughs> so haven't had a chance to get it tight on the ear, so we're just going to wrestle, but don't you, don't you mind that, okay? Here we go. 22 days before commitment day on 90 days of serving. If you were not able to be here last Sunday, please avail yourself to BethelOndale.com or the YouTube channel uh, where Bethel's at and watch that sermon last Sunday morning because we entered into the challenge of a serving revolution. On February the 7th will be commitment day for you to commit per the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I haven't dreamt all that out yet. I'll have it firm the Sunday before the 7th on what we're going to do in way of commitment. At the absolute very least, you're going to make a commitment to God on February the 7th during our Sunday service time that you're going to serve your world somewhere between 15 seconds and two hours a week. I'll leave that between you and God. And you're going to serve your community. If that means you're going to serve somebody in this church, that's fine. But I'm asking you to ask God, is there someone outside of this church? Maybe you're going to do both. And, and, and no, this, this does not count what you're already doing. This is something above and beyond what you're already doing. But the intention is for you and I to serve our community, our sphere of influence, up to two hours a week in addition to everything we're doing Already, I'm praying and I'm asking you to pray for a serving revolution to sweep our families, then our church, then our churches. We can be the example. We can be the example. Point number one here, and, and we're going to get, I'm going to have three points and then I'm going to have five points. Hopefully that will not confuse you. And uh, Brother Brad, I apologize. He asked me to send this to him uh, via email. I failed. I apologize. Why this can work. Why this can work. First of all, I want you to know that we are under a load. And I'm not talking about Bethel Baptist Church. I'm talking about every person on this planet. We are under a load. The first load that we're all under is sin. Now, uh, lots of folks outside of these walls do not know or realize that. They'll tell you what? Don't you worry about me. I'm fine. That's what the, they've told me that. Preacher, don't you worry about me. I'm fine. And that's years and years ago. That's where I learned this little tidbit. Good decisions are based on good information. For someone that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior to tell you that they are fine, that's a bad decision based on bad information. Because you see... You and I are facing an appointment with a holy God. We are. It's appointed unto man once to die. And then, the Bible says, the judgment. And if you and I do not have the shed blood of Jesus Christ on our soul because of our accepting of his sacrifice on our cross for, his, for our sins, then we're not ready for that appointment. We're not ready for that meeting. It's going to be ugly. It really is. Because you're going to have to stand there before a righteous, holy God and tell him the only thing that you have to show him is your righteousness. And the Bible says that yours and my righteousness are as filthy rags. And that comes out of the picture of what they used to do to bind the wounds of a leper. Leprosy. And I don't know if you know much about leprosy, but it's an evil, wicked disease. The skin literally corrupts and turns into pus. And it would fill those garments. And they would discard those garments every day and put new garments. And that's what yours and my righteousness looks like to God. We're not ready for that appointment unless we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. 
And so we need, watch this, you and me serving our community is going to work because they have a load. They have a load that they may not even be aware of. Not only do they have the load of sin, but they have the load of life. Trials and tribulations, flat tires are still happening, folks. Yeah, sicknesses everywhere. Trials and tribulations on a daily basis. Family messing up. Workplace, all the stuff that you're going through there. It is an unbelievable load. And then you have the load of responsibility. 30 years old and older in this room. 20 years old and older. You've got a lot of responsibility. Husband, wife, children, work, church for us. A lot of responsibility. The load is suffocating. The load of consequential circumstances. That poor decision a year ago that has led to the loss of a job, maybe that has led to legal uh, challenges, whatever the case may be. And in and, and some people's lives, that just runs rampant. When you and I start serving people, an amazing thing is going to happen. That load is going to get lighter. But watch this. That's never going to happen until you and I get under their load. So at the weekend to remember that I would encourage every married couple, or if you're thinking about marriage, to go to this. It's a weekend uh, to remember by Dennis Rainey and his ministry. Dennis Rainey's no longer involved, but his ministry, Family Life Today, is still carrying it through. And we had uh, the, the greatest couple that was leading us through this. It, w- it, was, a, it was a little short guy. <laughs> so I'm, I'm calling myself short too. It was a little short guy and his wife. They were the same size. And this is what they did. I never will forget it. He says, men, we feel our load. And he gets it up here and he does like a military press. And that was a poor military press, Rob. I apologize. Rob's a weightlifter. And so we feel our load. We know what we've got. We've got a wife, and we're supposed to take care of her. We've got children. We're supposed to take care of them. We've got a job. We're supposed to knock it out of the park with our job. We we live in a neighborhood. I'm supposed to mow my yard. We feel all of our load. The load of mom and dad aging. The load of brother and sister still expecting me to stay involved in their life. And just fill in the blank. We've got a load. And then he said this. And I feel it all. And then the wife, he's still over there standing like this. She said, ladies, a little better. We've got a load. And we feel it all. We've got a husband. Bless his heart. He needs taken care of. We've got, you're supposed to laugh at that. That's funny. Thank you. We got kids. And we're the primary caregiver to those children. Hey, pay attention. Thank you. I was just messing with you anyway, but that's great. All right, here we go. See what she has to live with. (laughs) I got, we feel it all. We've got a job. We've got moms and dads that are aging. We've got brothers and sisters that still expect us to stay involved. I fill in the blank. I feel it all. And then he said, I don't feel any of her weight. She said the same. And he said, so somebody has to make a choice to set their weight down long enough to say, looks pretty heavy. Tell me what's going on. You got you to get under the weight. No, physically, You're never going to accomplish that. But spiritually, mentally, emotionally, through empathy, you can get under their weight. You do it by asking, how did your day go? You know that situation you told me about yesterday? I prayed for that. How'd that go? You get under their weight. And and folks, can I just tell you, that seems like a full-time job just for the wife and the kids. 
in the church and the such. But we're called to go beyond that. We're called to do that well. And now look over to the neighbor. Now look over to the workmate. Now look over to the person that's hurting. And needs seen as an assignment given. Church, this is going to work because the people that are in your sphere of influence, they're under a load. And as you ask the Holy Spirit to make that load visible to you, he's going to do that. And then as you serve them, he's going to point them to himself. That's how it works. So the other day, uh, several weeks ago, I'm doing something, and I, I, I don't know, Brent, if you were over there that day or not, but it seems like somebody was over there. We were doing something, and the wind was bad, and the neighbor's trash can, aluminum trash can, was in the road. And, I, I mean, a need seen is an assignment given. And so I picked up my phone, and I called Mike. I said, Mike, in case you got a security camera, I'm not trying to steal anything. I'm not stealing your trash can. I'm trying to put it back so that it doesn't get blown out in the road. Oh, Ben, man, I appreciate that. I thank you so much. You know, and, and Mike's one of the nicest people you ever met. That was my opportunity right then, right there, to serve them. This works, and it's going to work. So why will it work? Because everyone's got the load of sin, because of the load of life's trials and burdens, because of the load of responsibility, the load of consequential circumstances. Be ye kind, the Bible says, Ephesians 4, 32. One to another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, even as God also in Christ forgave you. Now, some of you may be thinking, Brother Ben, there's somebody in my sphere of influence that I'm not going to be able to serve because you don't know what they've done to me. And this verse is to help you with that. You see, God himself says, this is how you forgive one another. You, you be tenderhearted. And folks, the only way that you can be tenderhearted is to put yourself in their trials and tribulations. I call it putting yourself in the oven of their trials and tribulations. And the heat of their trials and tribulations will tenderize your heart to their situation. And then you'll be able to set aside maybe what they've done to you, and then you can just help them. And, and watch this. Boy, hmm. they don't have to deserve it for you to help them because God has just asked you to do it. You know, there's this one verse that haunts me. Love your enemies. Church, we are in a pressure cooker of a situation in the United States of America, and a serving revolution just might turn the temp down. And irregardless of how all that plays out, you and I are not let off the hook of the Great Commission. And we must be willing to serve people no matter whether they're our enemies or not. Why will this work? Well, John 13, 34 35 says this, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, even as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. As we serve one another, as we serve the folks within our sphere of influence, the world is going to know who we are. We're disciples. That's how this is going to work. How will, I'm sorry, that's why it will work. How will this work? So we're going to end with these five points of how to develop a servant's heart. How to develop a servant's heart? This comes from Michelle Bingston. Never met her before in my life, but these are very, very good points. Point number one, <laughs> use Jesus. You remember the Sunday school answer? Jesus. Well, who made everything? Jesus. Who's the answer to everything? Jesus. What are you going to eat for lunch? Jesus. Okay. <laughs> use Jesus. As your model, Jesus was the greatest servant of all. Jesus came to earth as a servant with a commitment to serve. He always puts others' needs first. If he had come instead to be served, our salvation and sanctification could and would never have taken place. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Philippians 2, 6 through 7, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. John 13, 12 through 15, by coming as a servant, Jesus provided a living, breathing example for us to follow of how we are to treat others and the approach we are to take in our relationships. This is where the verse starts. So when he had washed their feet, 
and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Now, 2021, we do not need to wash one another's feet. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. If we did that as, you know, just a humbling ceremony, that would be fine. And it truly is. We've done it a time or two here at Bethel. But you take off your freshly scented shoes in some case. You take off your socks. And hopefully underneath all of that is a somewhat recently washed foot. Yeah. Was not the case when the word of God was written. They had sandals. Apparently somebody had not had the brilliant idea of let's just enclose that thing. It's ugly. Let's put stuff all around it. And they walked in sandals everywhere they went. And they walked in dust. And they walked in gravel. And they walked in mud. And they also hadn't embraced the table or the, the exp- suspended table or chairs yet. So when they ate, they reclined. And every time you reclined, if it was a bunch of people, guess what's right here? Feet. Feet that has been through all of that stuff. And you're eating. So, you know what they did? Hey, you. You're the slave. Get you a basin, get you some warm water, get you some soap, and let's wash these feet. Sir, yes, sir. And they did it. And the slave, it became a thing. The slaves washed their feet. And Jesus took the position of a slave, and he washed their feet. And then he said, I, being the Lord, the creator of all things, I just washed your feet. I set an example for you. You should wash one another's feet. Why is this going to work, church? How is it going to work? When you humble yourself to meet the needs of the people that you see and you serve them, that's how it's going to work. They're going to realize, hey, 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 there's something different about this fella. There's something different about this lady. And why are you, why is it working? Because you are living the example that Jesus set before us. Point number two under this point, if we want to be great, We must be least. When we watch the example that Jesus was for his disciples and for us, he has really given us two choices. This is going to hurt. Are you ready? We can choose to serve ourselves or we can choose to serve others. If we choose to serve ourselves, then we cannot be his disciples. That's just the truth. Because he taught his disciples that if they are going to follow him, they had to be willing to put themselves last. If we choose to serve others, then we show others his love. And in that way, they will know we are his disciples. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. God's kingdom operates differently from our earthly hierarchical structures. Greatness in God's kingdom does not come from occupying positions of power or being praised by men. God is more interested in a servant heart and our attitude toward others. Not so with you, Matthew 20, 26. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. A hindrance to being a good servant is a desire for praise, power, recognition by others, or self-exaltation. And then this part, Luke 22, 24 through 30. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, he's talking to you, church. The greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? 
Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer. Jesus is talking to you. I confer on you a kingdom. But what kind of a kingdom? Just as my Father conferred upon me, Jesus says, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But you've got to serve first. If we will serve, heaven will be all heaven is supposed to be. We must choose to serve others and be the least of these in order to have a servant heart. Number three, we show our love for others. I'm sorry. We show our love for God by loving others. Jesus told his disciples and us that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. Our obedience is an outward demonstration of our love for God. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Whoever, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. When we obey God's commandments, we exhibit a servant heart. We're almost done. Point number four, consider others before yourself. In today's society, there has become a tendency to focus on self-fulfillment rather than making it a priority to serve God and others. Does that ring true? Does that make sense? That there has become a tendency to focus on self-fulfillment rather than making it a priority to serve God and others. This is not consistent with Scripture. Philippians 2, 3 through 4, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Can I confess to you, church, that is probably the most difficult scripture that I struggle with daily. To make other people's interests more important to me than my own. Modern society has made an industry out of self-fulfillment and self-help for everything from dieting (laughs) to reaching one's greatest potential. The focus of a Christian should instead be on knowing and loving God, and from that relationship, serving others according to the example Jesus provided. Serving others according to the example we have in Jesus is a quality of having a servant's heart. And then lastly, using your gifts in order to serve. Every person under the sound of my voice has been given a gift from God at the point of spiritual birth. You were given a gift. And it's that spiritual gift that you are to supernaturally serve God through. Now watch this. We're supposed to cultivate all of the gifts. We are. I'm supposed to show mercy even though I'm not anything related to a mercy. I'm not. Thank you, Brother David, for that support. (laughs) I'm messing He's amening the fact that I'm telling you that even though I'm not spiritually gifted to be a mercy, I am to cultivate that gift. And I got one in my home. And I can watch her and I can learn from her. Well, I'm gifted to see right from wrong. She can't see that on a chalkboard (laughs) because she's a mercy. And it goes against her to call anything wrong. Well, you, you gotta you got to call some things wrong, and amens rang through the building. It's true. And so she's got to cultivate that, and we all are supposed to cultivate all of the gifts. But watch this. There's one that you supernaturally have been enabled by the Holy Spirit to serve God with. And when you connect with that, service becomes fun. Serving others through the spiritual gift that God has given you becomes fun. God has given each of us certain gifts and talents that we are to use for serving others. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. That's 1 Peter 4.10. In turn, serving others may be what God uses to touch their hearts and draw them to him. Share the love of God by using your gifts to serve others. It's another aspect of having a servant heart. So, use your gifts in order to serve. Consider others before yourself. Show your love for God by loving others.
If we want to be great, we must be least. Use Jesus as your model. This is how to develop a servant heart. So the challenge. God. Who, what, how do you want me to serve? Those 90 days, starting February the 8th to May the 8th, and yeah, if you count it, it's actually 91. It's okay. Up to two hours a week. Now, if he calls you to more than that, that's between you and him. Where can I serve? Church, I I don't know yet what I'm going to do. I don't, but I, I got some ideas. You need to start thinking. Ask God. You've got a couple weeks. The week before the 7th, I'm going to get really pointed on how I want those commitments to be made known, if I want them to be made known, and we'll go from there. If we will throw ourselves into this, God can do something perhaps we've never seen him do. Let's stand. Musicians, will you come? Every head bowed, every eye closed. We have some of the medical community here today. We have many of them who serve and who attend this church. So this is in no way an indictment upon them. It, it's honestly just to be used as an illustration because I, I believe that there's probably more than the medical community that have experienced this, but probably not to the level that they have. And I, I heard this from someone who was in, I think it was St. John's, and she was basically in charge, you know, like human resource person. So she, she was responsible for the health if you will, of those workers there at St. John's, uh, now called Mercy. And she made this statement about everything that's been going on and, and with the numbers increasing and the hospitals filling up and the such. She made this statement. Our staff and most, if not all, medical staff are struggling with compassion fatigue. Meaning that from the start of their shift to the end of their shift, they are in unbelievable pressure cooker situations, life and death situations related to COVID and the such, and they've been in it for so long, they're struggling. They're not just struggling on a professional medical level, they're struggling on a mental, emotional level of character. It's wearing them out. If that's where you're at as just as a church member, you know, this is a pretty common theme to serve people. It's a pretty common expectation. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you're just wore out because of your family situation, because of the job situation, because church maybe even, whatever the case may be, you're just wore out. I respect that. And this may be the absolute last thing you want to hear. You're asking me to sign up for even more, Brother Ben. N no. No, I, no, I'm not. Watch this. I'm asking you to grab the horns of the altar, and that's a figurative speech. In the, in the Old Testament, the altar of mercy had horns. And you would grab those horns, and you would throw yourself on the mercy of God. That's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to seek health and holiness and then just simply follow God's leadership. Because God, if I've done what I'm supposed to do, this is not from Ben Kingston, this is from God. I felt led in October to do this in January. It's January. And so I'm asking you to seek the Holy Spirit and just humbly ask him, where would you have me serve? How would you have me serve? And then, Father, give me your resources to accomplish that.
can't remember all of the facts and figures, but I was in a pretty dark place one time, and I heard a preacher say these words. When you run out of your strength, run into his. When you run out of your faith, run into his. And he just summarized that with, when you run out of your resources, you need to run into God. Because God's resources never run out. Father, we stand before you as a congregation that we are concerned, we are scared, uh, hurt of what's going on in our nation, in our world. We hear the statistics of abortion and it breaks our heart. But we come before you this morning not wanting to be a part of the problem, but we want to be a part of the solution. We believe that Jesus Christ has set us on a heavenly track that cannot be diverted. We're going to heaven because of the finished work of your son. But Father, you don't want us to come alone. You want us to bring others with us. So we're asking you to help us in this challenge to connect with you and to know how we can serve the people within our sphere of influence. Father, if there's someone here that does not know you in the free pardon of sin, we pray that they'll be saved for its everlasting healing. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Will you come?